Big Show. Common Sense. Thought-provoking radio. It's Tuesday, which means that Brad Keithley always joins us for a couple big segments. Brad is a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, now retired, but he went ahead and founded an organization called Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, which does, well, just that. It fights for a sustainable budget for the state of Alaska. He and I every week go over different aspects of the Alaskan economy, specifically focusing on oil and gas, uh, but also on the politics of the situation, taxation, and much more. He joins us this morning to discuss uh, the latest and greatest events in the state. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? You know, it's just another beautiful day in paradise. That's all I'm saying. After all that rain yesterday, I'm, I'm looking for my white Christmas. I'm hoping we get a little bit of snow to keep us white for the Christmas time. You know, with that bumper music, it's hard It's hard not to be in the mood, isn't it? It is. It really, I mean, that's my childhood, really, right there. You give me some big band, some 40s and 50s era Christmas music, and I'm, like, right there transported to my childhood. So it's uh, good stuff. It is that. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the issues that are facing the state of Alaska. Obviously, you know, one of the big things that uh, is out there is this discussion on uh, the China deal. Uh, you know, there's a question about whether or not they will sell it. We talked a little bit about that last week. The producers will sell it if Alaska is going to try and buy it. Uh, but we also want to get into the discussion on what the oil industry is saying out there. They're shopping the argument out there that the state's tax policy is to blame for a lot of the problems. And, and uh, you know, are we are we overstating it? Let's start off there this morning. Well, I mean, are we overstating the problem uh, or is it a perception deal? Where are we at? Well, I think I think taxes certainly are important to the oil industry. Um I think I think though we 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 talk about that so much, or the industry talks about that so much, uh, that they that they lose sight of other things that are important to the state uh, from a fiscal policy standpoint as well. There's there's been a couple of recent articles. You can start seeing the drumbeat beginning for the next legislative session. Uh, there's there's speculation that some will make an effort to change oil taxes in the next session to revise them upwards, and you can start to see the counter push uh, uh, building. There was an editorial in the um, uh, Juno Empire uh, within this past week, uh, a few days ago, uh, that talked about the importance of keeping uh, taxes on the industry down at this critical time with oil prices down and with competitiveness from shale and other sources. Um, and then there was another article in a in a, uh, a a blog called Real Clear Business or Real Clear Markets rather uh, that was sort of to the same the same effect. Now, I- interestingly enough, neither of those articles were by Alaskans. Uh, <laughs> one was one in the Juno Empire. The one in the Juno Empire was by a guy by the name of David Williams, uh, who is president of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, one of the trade associations in D.C. that that fights for uh, low taxes uh, at both the national level and the state level. That was the article, that was the editorial in the Juno Empire uh, arguing about oil taxes. And then the one in Real Clear Markets uh, was uh, from a guy by the name of Pete Sepp, who's president of the National Taxpayers Union, uh, another uh, Washington, D.C.-based uh, 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 interest group uh, focused on uh, tax policy at both the federal and state level. The the two the two organizations aren't the same. They aren't the same person. But the articles, the commentaries, look very similar in terms of of them advising Alaska on what what it should do about oil tax policy. And frankly, I'm not all that concerned about what they said about. Uh, oil tax policy. It, it, I mean, it was basically don't overtax your your most important industry. That's a good message. But what really bothers me is what these guys don't say. I mean, so they spend a lot, an, an entire commentary talking about the importance of the oil industry and the importance of not taxing the oil industry and the bad things that can happen when when you tax the oil industry and how important it is to your economy to keep the oil industry uh, solid and, and not tax it. At the same time as as the Alaska legislature and the Alaska governor have imposed a 50% tax on the permanent fund dividend 
which our own economists have told us uh, uh, has the largest adverse – imposing that tax has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy, overall Alaska economy, of all of the fiscal measures, uh, the, the new revenue measures that, the, that, that have been analyzed. So I understand the importance of the oil industry, and I understand the significance of, of not overtaxing the oil industry. But if you're going to talk about the Alaska economy, which is how both of these articles, both of these commentaries started out, uh, and said, you know, this is critical to the Alaska economy. Uh, we have to, we have to do this and do it right, said these guys from D.C. Um, but you know, we have to do it and we have to do it right. If you're going to start an article out, a commentary out about talking about what's important to the overall to the Alaska economy, you ought to be talking about the PFD at least as well, if not headline uh, <laughs> the article about that, because that right. has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy. And so right. I get a little I get a little bothered when these guys come in, sort of you know, uh, parachute in to the Alaska debate, uh, and want to tell Alaskans what's important to the overall Alaska economy, when they don't touch on the one thing that actually we've done wrong, that actually we've done to hurt the Alaska economy, uh, and and have taxed uh, all Alaskans. Uh, you know, if we're going to talk about the Alaska economy, let's talk about that at least also, if not if not first on the list. Right, because, I mean, I think you and I agree that, you know, constantly changing the tax structure is not beneficial. We should find something and stick with it for a period of years. And I don't know if there's a, a window, if we should say 10 years, it could be revisited every 10 years or so. But uh, to, to, to point it out and say, oh, this is all bad, but all this is good. And and again, I think that we've seen, if not uh, if not a wink and a nod, at least some complicity on the part of industry groups and others who are against taxes uh, on the oil industry, but are just fine and dandy with the taxation of the citizens of the state to the tune of you know four or five thousand dollars per average family. That's no problem. But you know, keep your hands off our stuff. And this is the this again is what I was talking about earlier in the national tax bill. This kind of the detriment of crony capitalism in this kind of issue, where they're okay as long as you're taxing somebody else, it's okay. Yeah, exactly right. And and you know, the, the chamber chamber comes to mind quickly when you're talking about organizations that are talking about you know defend the tax defend the oil industry at all costs, but but you know sort of give a wink and a nod to. Uh, to the PFD tax, I, it, 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 there are there are people in Alaska. There are people nationally, obviously, with these two pieces. But there are people who are focusing on defending uh, uh, an industry uh, and and making sure that it's a big industry. No argument about it. It's an industry that I that I spent 35 years of my life and still spend some of my life in. Absolutely important industry. Absolutely no question about that. But it's not the only it's not the only industry out there. It's not the only thing that drives the Alaska economy. And we need to be concerned about all parts of it. It it I think it undermines, to be honest, to me at least, I think it undermines the oil industry's argument when they focus all of the attention on themselves, when they focus all of the arguments about the Alaska economy. On, them, on themselves, because it, it becomes too easy to dismiss them as a special interest group just focused on themselves. If you really want to, if you really want to assure Alaskans that you're looking out for Alaskans, then look out for the overall Alaska economy. Just don't don't focus and, and just look out for yourself. When you talk about the overall Alaska economy, talks about talk about things that affect the overall Alaska economy uh, instead of just just looking out for yourself. In terms of oil taxes, I, I, we need – what we need to do – we don't need to change them every year, certainly. We don't need to change them necessarily on any given timeline. But we need – what we need to do is make sure that Alaska remains competitive for investment capital, uh, productive investment capital, to, to continue to, to develop our resources. We need to make sure that we bring the sufficient investment into the state – to, to, to develop the resources. And sometimes that means that we can let taxes go for a long period of time. Sometimes it means that we've gotten out of kilter like we did with ACEs, uh, and we need, to, we need to adjust the tax structure to get us back uh, into, into an investment profile. Um, and, and that's, it, it, in, in a few years ago, 
uh, well, as part of SB 21, we established, the legislature established the Oil and Gas Competitiveness Review Board, which is charged with monitoring uh, what's going on in the oil and gas, in oil and gas investment, charged with looking at Alaska, Alaska uh, from the standpoint of, of its attractiveness or how it measures up uh, relative to the rest of the world in terms of investment. Um, and I think the, the Oil and Gas Competitiveness Review Board has done a decent job of doing that. I think the legislature looking at these, looking at taxes, monitoring taxes, making sure we remain, to, re, we remain competitive is a good thing to do. Um, and, and that's really, that's the important focus on the oil and gas side. But, but, but when you focus on the overall Alaska economy, when you start making arguments or statements about this is important to the overall Alaska economy, uh, or you know, oil's critical, and so we've got to make sure that that oil's taken care of. Yes, it is, but focus on the overall Alaska economy and focus on things that the, the other tax policies that are hurting the Alaska economy, like the PFD cuts. We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget here on the Michael Duke Show, AM seven hundred KBYR and Oldies one hundred two point one. So, Brad, when we come down to this election cycle, which is going to be an important one, 50 of the 60 legislators in the state uh, in the state legislature are up for re-election. And you and I have talked about, you know, again, the most detrimental effect. We beat this horse to death, but I think it's, it, it, it is the, the most critical component of what we've been talking about. Um, wh- what, what should we be doing when this election cycle starts to roll around? I mean, for reals, because we've got people already announcing and everything else, but it's going to get hot and heavy coming into spring. What should we be looking for? What should we be doing? What are some of the things that we should be doing? And what should we be asking the players in this, uh, in this theater uh, about, uh, about uh, these issues? A la- so, so the fundamental question to me, is Alaska's in a recession? What are what what is your view of what we should be doing about it? What government should be doing uh, about uh, Alaska being in a recession? Uh, government can do things that make it worse. Government can do things that make it better. What's your view about uh, how we how we work Alaska out of a recession? And part of the so that that to me is the fundamental question. That if I if I if somebody said you're on a panel. You're supposed to ask questions of candidates. That would be the first question I would ask. Part of the answer to me needs to be uh, uh, restore the PFD because the PFD has the largest cutting the PFD. I wonder how many times I've said that <laughs> on this program, how many times I've written it. But but cutting the cutting the PFD, according to ICER, according to the to the only economic analysis, uh, independent economic analysis that's, that's been out there that's addressed it. Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy is by far the worst alternative from the standpoint of Alaska families. That that is what the economists, the analysis has told us about cutting the PFD. So, first question is, what are you going to do about about dealing with the fact we're in a recession? Part of the answer needs to be to restore the PFD. If that's not a candidate's answer, if that's not part of the candidate's answer. Uh, either A, he doesn't understand the Alaska economy, or B, he really doesn't care about the Alaska, the overall Alaska economy. He cares about some subset of it more. If he talks, if the first thing out of his mouth is, well, we got to treat the oil industry fairly, or if the first thing out of his mouth is, we've got to get a fiscal plan to, 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 to stabilize government spending, or if the first thing out of his mouth is uh, we've got to we've got to make sure we don't have those bad income taxes come to Alaska. What what that is a signal of is that they're more concerned about individual segments of the Alaska economy than they are about the overall Alaska economy. And and one thing one thing that I hold to is the overall economy is what's important because that's the boat that 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 that, that will lift all of us. Not, right. I mean, yes, oil taxes will affect those tied to the oil industry. Government fiscal plan for government will affect uh, uh, those tied to the government economy. Uh, income taxes will affect the top 20 percent uh, more than others. All those things affect segments of the Alaska economy. I want to hear the candidates, particularly candidates for state office, 
for governor, statewide office, for governor and lieutenant governor, but also candidates for Senate in the House. I want to hear them be concerned about the overall Alaska economy. And the first thing, the first thing out of their mouth that they're going to do that is they need to be concerned about PFD cuts because that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. And like you said, a rising tide floats all boats. So if you affect the overall economy, everybody benefits instead of, again, picking winners and losers, which seems to be the situation that we're constantly finding ourselves in with government at the national level, at the at the state and the local levels, the same thing. They're always picking the winners and losers instead of making sure that everybody's boat floats at the same rate. Uh, yep, Brad, exactly right. Brad, Brad Keithley is our guest. The Michael Duke Show. You're over Common Sense Radio. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, who is a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, now retired, but founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, where they deal with helping create, uh, you know, a plan or at least pushing for a plan that, uh, you know, creates sustainable budgets for the future of the state of Alaska. Uh, Brad and I were just uh, we were chuckling right before the break. That I mean, I don't know how many times we're going to have to say it. Maybe one more. Maybe it's the next time but that the taking of the PFD had the largest detrimental negative impact on the overall economy in the state of Alaska that they could have possibly, of any action they could have possibly taken. And I guess we're going to keep harping on that till the day we die, but that's that's where we're at right now. But let's take a look, a, a little bit bigger look now, Brad, at the overall picture. And the overall picture right now includes the national scene, which, of course, is the new Senate tax bill, which has passed its hurdle of going through the House and the Senate. Now it's going to face a conference committee. Uh, there's good things. There's bad things. I've talked a little bit about it earlier in the program. What are your thoughts on the uh, overall, the taxation bill, uh, the pluses and the minuses? Let's go from there. Well, let's start with the pluses. The pluses are that it that it that the Senate bill includes a provision that effectively opens ANWR. It requires the leasing, uh, uh, opening ANWR to leasing. Leasing is the first step, access is the first step to oil and gas development. You have to have access to, to the land before you can do anything on it. Uh, we've had, we've, ANWR has been closed throughout because of the prohibition or the, the lack of leases, the lack of opportunity to get on the, uh, on the, the in the 1002 area and do exploration. Um, and so the bill, the Senate bill contains provisions that require leasing uh, in ANWR. That's a big step for Alaska. It will generate uh, activity in terms of uh, uh, leases and lease bonuses at the beginning uh, that will be shared with uh, with Alaska between the Alaska and the feds, uh, and then it will generate uh, activity in terms of exploration up there, staging of exploration, jobs for people engaged in exploration, and then if the exploration is successful um, and 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 or isn't closed by some subsequent administration, uh, a big if. Uh, it will be um, uh, Alaska will benefit through uh, ultimately the hopeful discovery of, of, of hydrocarbon resources and the development of those resources and additional oil into taps and potentially additional gas to back up a, a gas line. So that that's that's the positive. It's a, it's something that I remember. I was in a briefing takes me way back in a briefing with Frank Murkowski in 1980, Senator Frank Murkowski, when Reagan was elected, I guess it was 81, when Reagan was elected, and Mur first thing on, on Senator Frank Murkowski's list was, how do we get Anwar open? Um, and, <laughs> and now we're, you know, leap forward 37 years, uh, and, we, and we actually have made progress in, in having this in the Senate bill. A big plus, cannot be diminished, diminished has to be recognized. That being said, the Senate bill does a couple of, of, of not so good and, and in some senses bad things. Uh, one is that it will uh, increase the national debt. Now, the Republican senators, as they scrambled around to try to cover themselves prior to the vote, kept saying, oh, no, it's going to produce growth that will outstrip the cost in terms of lost revenues. The basic theory is that the economy will grow, the taxes from that growth in the economy will offset the, the drop in revenues resulting from the tax from the tax cuts. That's been the theory, um, the Laffer curve theory that's that's been out there since again 1980, since the since the Reagan administration. Uh, the problem is all of the analyses, all of the analyses, uh, the nonpartisan analyses that have been put together 
analyzing the effect of the bill say that's not true that it will increase the national that it will increase the debt the 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 additional revenues generated by economic growth triggered by the tax cuts uh, will the additional government revenue tax revenue will not offset the cost so if spending continues at projected levels uh, the revenues will go down they won't be offset by by additional revenues generated by economic growth and the debt will grow and the debt that that they're projecting uh, the additional debt projecting over over the 10 years that they've looked at this thing is an additional trillion dollars of debt we have a 20 trillion dollars in debt now so we're growing debt by national debt by an addition at least an additional five percent some of the analyses say that the that the the growth in debt will be even greater than that. Republicans have scrambled. Uh, that The latest analysis came out from the Joint Tax Committee uh, right before the vote on Thursday. Uh, the vote was subsequently on Friday. Republicans scrambled uh, at that, Republican senators in particular scrambled to try to deal with, uh, with that analysis. And they kept saying, oh, I've talked to economists. Dan Sullivan did this. I've talked to economists privately. And they've said, oh, no, growth will be larger than that. But there's no analysis that backs it up. We've been waiting on the Treasury, Department of Treasury, to come up with its, its own analysis. Secretary Mnuchin has said all along the way that we've got, an, we've got analysis that shows that this bill will more than pay for itself. It will generate more revenues, tax revenues, than, than we lose uh, because of economic growth. But the Treasury's never produced that analysis. It's become such an embarrassment that the inspector general of the Department of Treasury is now has launched an investigation into why that analysis, if there is one, has, ever, has never seen the light of day. So <laughs> there's no analysis that backs it up. The analysis that's out there, the nonpartisan uh, detailed analysis that's out there says it grows debt. And, and if you are concerned about the growth of national debt, as I am, if you view it as a tax on future generations, as I do, that's a that's a big deal. Uh, uh, passing a bill that increases national debt uh, is is a big deal. There is also a problem with the bill in terms of individual tax rates. Uh, the Republicans to try to keep the debt down, the the, the net loss in revenue down, uh, terminate all of the individual tax rates uh, in 2025, so that by 2027 there's effectively been an increase for all individual tax rates across the board uh, as a result of the, the change in the deductions that they've permitted, um, uh, tax deductions that, that, that they're going to permit, um, and the termination or the expiration of the, of the reductions in the tax rate. So by 2027, all taxpayers, all individual tax rates are paying more. Now, the Republicans, again, will tell you, well, those will never happen. Once we get there, they, people will extend uh, those terminations. But remember, the terminations were put there in order to keep the cost of debt, in order to keep the debt effect uh, constrained. Right. And so if you terminate, if you now are telling us that we're going to terminate those 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 individual uh, uh, or, or extend those individual tax reductions to keep individuals from suffering a higher tax rate, you've just blown up the, 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 the effect on the effect on overall debt even greater to a much greater extent than the billion dollars that or trillion dollars that that the analysts already tell us that we're increasing national debt. So this bill has very good part for Alaska in terms of Anwar. No denying that. And and I can easily see why Senators Murkowski and Sullivan voted for it. But on the back end, this bill is a ticking time bomb in terms of the impact it's going to have on future generations through raising uh, raising the national debt. We're talking with Brad Keithley here on the Michael Duke Show, AM 700, KBYR, Oldies 102.1. But, Brad, isn't this the problem with pretty much all legislation in our modern age today, is that it's always these competing special interests that are out there pushing back and forth? I mean, we're seeing the same thing at the state level that we're seeing. Again, I've always said that the – that the, as the as the as as goes the nation, so goes the states and the municipalities around the country. I mean, we're seeing this all over the place. These special interests buying in and basically controlling the process to the point to where the real losers overall seem to always be the average citizen, always be that you know that middle class. They seem to be the ones that are always taking it in the shorts. 
Well, it's certainly the case, it's, as, as we've just discussed, it's certainly the case with Alaska with, with everybody carving out and saying, oh, don't affect the oil industry, uh, don't affect – uh, uh, the cruise industry don't affect this or that industry in the overall economy, but but go ahead and cut the PFD in the overall economy, and and all Alaskans, the average Alaskan family, taking it taking a, a, a serious hit from that. It's also the case with the federal tax bill. Yes, a lot of the a lot of the effect uh, uh, from the a lot of the cause for uh, the 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 revenue reduction is from the drop in the corporate interest rate and from a bunch of of, of fairly sophisticated changes that are being made to benefit this industry or that industry uh, or protect more more often protect this industry uh, or that industry from the consequences of other tax changes that are being made there's an article in the ADN today or yesterday that talked about sort of the net impact uh, or the totality of the impact on Alaska of the various actions taken and and one of the things that, that Senator Sullivan got in as part of the final amendments on the final day of the bill was to eliminate a tax increase that the bill had uh, for uh, the cruise industry uh, on the argument that, oh, Alaska is uh, dependent, uh, southeast in particular, on the tourism industry. A lot of that comes from boats. Uh, this tax on the cruise industry will make it more expensive, perhaps drive boats out of ships out of Alaska waters or out of U.S. waters uh, and to other to other locations. And so we need to we need to protect against that. Well, that's about a seventy million dollar hit, not huge from the stand when we're talking about a trillion dollars, but it's about a seventy million dollar hit uh, to the overall uh, revenue generation that was in the tax bill. Uh, that now <laughs> is going to be added in one way or fashion, fashion or another is going to be added to national debt. So, so you've got uh, a, yes, you, we have the problem with with special interests always taking these opportunities to come in and carve out protections for themselves at the loss of, in the case of, in the case of uh, of the national bill now, at the at the expense of future generations uh, in terms of being burdened with. Uh, increased debt as a consequence of the bill. At, yeah. it, I, at, that's that's why I go back and say the first question I'm going to ask a candidate in the in the upcoming state elections is we're in a recession. What are you going to do about the recession? What are you going to do about the overall economy? And if their if their answer begins with essentially I'm going to protect this special interest, then I'm done. You know that's not a candidate <laughs> I'm going to support. I want yeah. candidates supporting the overall economy first. Then we can talk about special interests that contribute pieces to the overall economy. But talk to me about the overall economy first. Uh, we're down to less than two minutes, Brad. Can you give me a 90-second synopsis on this uh, job loss on the on the North Slope that we're talking about quickly? Yeah. So so what happened is Hillcorp announced that they're switching contractors from from one contractor from ASRC Energy Services to another. Uh, to provide certain services up there, ASRC Energy Services was the loser in that bidder in that bidding. So they're releasing the employees that they used in connection with those services. Uh, Hillcorp uh, Hillcorp's not going to go without those services. They've gone to a lower bidder, uh, and and that lower bidder is going to need people to do that work as well. So the expectation is is a large number uh, of those employees will simply switch over. Uh, to to the lower bidder and continue because of their expertise, I'll have the the lower bidder will hire them. We may have some loss in in income and in wages because the lower bidder likely bid <laughs> on uh, on lower labor costs. Uh, but but jo ab ab absolute job loss, I doubt we're going to see uh, those hundred jobs go away in terms of job losses. We're just going to see them switch from wearing blue uniforms to green uniforms or or something of that nature. Right. Well. We got to leave it there. Unfortunately, Brad Keithley, thanks for coming in and joining us. Uh, appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next week. Okay. Thanks for having me, Michael. We're we're hoping you are enjoying.